Talking Tolkien Podcast, Episode 11, Leaf by Niggle, Part 2, The Story. Hi everyone, John Carswell here. Welcome to the Talking Tolkien Podcast, your conversational guide to Middle Earth and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, Greta and I pick up our discussion of Leaf by Niggle in midstream. Keep in mind that this episode was originally intended to be part of the previous episode, so we essentially jump right in to discussing the story. If you haven't listened to the previous episode yet, it might help to familiarize yourself with the story, but regardless, I hope you enjoy our discussion of one of Tolkien's most beautiful stories. Okay, we're back. Um, so we've we spent a little time discussing, kind of setting the stage for where Leaf by Niggle came from and what's involved in Leaf by Niggle, what Tolkien himself said about Leaf by Niggle. Yep. Um, so let's start talking about the story. Let's do it. Um, I thought you'd never ask. Yes. Um, so what kind of person is Niggle? What would you say about Niggle, Niggle. himself? Um... Are we talking personality or just in general? Yeah. How's he described? Yeah, just whatever. Well, we know whatever he's, you think. A, he's a little man. Um, not very tall, I take it to mean. And he likes to paint. Mm-hmm. And um, he's very kind-hearted. Yes. He, he does. He has a very kind heart. Um, yet, he... He doesn't have the best attitude about, like, even though his heart is very kind, his initial response is not usually the most positive. Yeah. Um, well, he even says, he even says, um, I wish I was more strong-minded, you know, <laughs> meaning that he wanted, he wished other people's troubles did, mo- did not make him feel uncomfortable. I can totally identify with that. Yeah. So identify with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, you know, he just, it's, it's funny because he, he admit, he, it's said of him that he's kind hearted, but, um, he almost wishes he wasn't, you know, and, um, you know, so he's kind of this person who's like, okay, this person needs help. I guess I could better go help him, you know? So it's not like he's this yeah. super altruistic guy who's just like, someone needs help. The bat signal is being shown. <laughs> I must go to their aid. You know, he's like, right. he's like, he doesn't go looking. He doesn't go looking to help people. Like, he doesn't yeah. go looking for, you know, for, for people to help or right. cases to solve or anything like that. Yeah. But when people come to him, he is willing to help. Yeah, he almost, it, you almost get this impression that he, um, I can't remember if it says this explicitly, but you almost get this impression that he lives out in the country so he that he won't it have. He says that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he wouldn't. He, he purposely lives away from town, away from. You know, I think he has one close neighbor, and that's it. Yeah, and he, yeah, because he. And it just so happens around. that his one close neighbor is extremely needy. Very needy, very yeah. needy, poor guy. Yeah, but I can identify with Niggle a lot in a lot of, um, in, in that way in particular because, mm-hmm. um, and I, and I don't know if this is just a, a personality flaw or what, but I think other people's troubles affect. Some people more than others. Yeah. Some people can just be like, you know, like just let it rain off their back. And I'm not saying that those people are bad people. And I'm not saying that they don't want to help them either. But I'm saying they don't take it on as a personal burden. Yeah. But I think there are people out there that do. That do see other people's hurts and other people's needs. And they do. They take that on. And it becomes a personal thing for those people. And it's... Um, and, and it was interesting to me that he actually used the word strong-minded. Because... To me, it's almost more, um, I don't know that it's strong-minded that I would care. I don't, I don't know that being more strong-minded would help. Yeah. I feel like it's still more of a heart issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's it's difficult finding that balance yeah. between, you know, wanting to help somebody and being able to help somebody, but also you, you don't want to become so affected by it mm-hmm. that, it, and that it, you know, basically... 
renders your helping ineffectual in a right. way. Well, it says, he says, you know the sort of kind heart. It made him uncomfortable more often than it made him do anything. And even when he did anything, it did not prevent him from grumbling, losing his temper, and swearing. So, you know, you just all, you almost get this picture of Niggle like he's just this kind of, I mean, it depends on, you know, he, he's like, he's, he's a nice person. It basically, it feels to me like he's a nice person. Um, he's he's going to be friendly to you if you're if you show up at his mm-hmm. door, mm-hmm. but he's going to be trying to get you to leave as quickly as possible because you annoy him a little bit, and yeah. um, and you know y- you can't really look at him and say oh he's this like great human being you know he's no. he's just kind mm-hmm. of like he's you know I mean that even there it just says um, it made him uncomfortable more often than it made him do anything so. Yeah. So usually this kind heart didn't actually even get him to do anything about certain issues. It just got him uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Um, And so, so here he is and he's making this, what he really wants to do is just paint. He wants to paint all the time. Right. Says that he wished that he had a pension, a public pension so that he could just paint all the time. Yes. Um, Yeah. But he doesn't have one. And um, so... But the what the painting he's trying to paint has kind of started from this one little um, leaf that he mm-hmm. uh, that he started painting. It says he was the sort of painter who can paint leaves better than trees. So he's very detail oriented. I take that to mean yes. um, he uh, he can't see the forest for the trees. Maybe you know the the, the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Um, he's mm-hmm. just very good at doing the details. I think you could probably see in Tolkien in that because. You know, Tolkien obviously got really loved the details of a thing. You see that all through mm-hmm. his works. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't content with just telling you there was um, that um, there was a ring. Right. He had to give you the whole history of where the ring came from yeah. and all of the things that you know it was involved in leading up to that. Right. Um, uh, you know, behind everything in Tolkien's Middle Earth, there's a deep story. You yeah. know. Uh, yeah. Associated with it, so yeah. you know you get that you get that same sense here from Niggle that he was, um, uh, he you know he spent all this spent all this time just on a single leaf. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, but he wanted to make a whole tree, and so he because he's detail oriented, it's going to take him a long time because he has to spend a lot of time on each individual leaf to make a whole tree. Right. right. He can't just paint a big tree. He's got to make each individual leaf and make it just perfect to go with mm-hmm. this with this tree. Yep. Um, so um, that's a huge problem for him being kind-hearted, quote unquote kind-hearted. He keeps getting interrupted. Right. It doesn't and, even say that. I love that in here that he calls them. Um, he actually calls them interruptions, doesn't he? Like instead mm-hmm. of calling them, um, I forget what I thought that we'll come to it. But he actually, instead of you know calling them visits or requests, he refers to them as interruptions, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, I think we're also getting a picture of Niggle here as being just a hardcore introvert. Yeah. I think he's just very happy, just him and his canvas and his paintbrush and, like you said, his public pension. Right. Yeah. Well, if he had a public pension, he'd love if to have he a had public a public pension. pension yeah. um, he would be just all set. Yeah, and the other thing is that he's apparently got this journey he's supposed to go on. He had yes. a long journey he was supposed to long make. Journey. We don't learn mm-hmm. more much about this early on, but we know that there is a long journey that he's supposed to go on. And he's a little anxious about it. Yeah. And he knows it's coming up, and he knows he should be preparing for it. Yeah. But he's so focused on painting right. that he, he doesn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, he... Basically, what happens? We, you know, you kind of set the stage. We got this picture of Niggle now, and what happens um, is Parrish uh, finds himself in trouble. Right? Initially, um, Parrish comes to him and says, "And and did we say who Parrish was?" Yeah, Parrish is his neighbor. Well, I knew that. I yeah. didn't know if we had explained that. Yeah, yeah. Par- Parrish is his neighbor, who's a his gardener. One close neighbor. Parrish is a gardener, yes. and um, Parrish and Niggle don't really get each other. Um, right. Parrish, they, they, they don't talk a lot, uh, really only when they need to. Right. And Parrish will come over and look at Niggle's painting and just be like, what are you doing? And, and mm-hmm. look at his 
garden, Nichols' garden, and be like, and it's just a mess. And he's like, what, you know, this is, you should be taking care of your garden and you're not doing it. Right. Right. Um, And, uh, and likely Nickel doesn't really get Parrish either. Right. No, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, they're just kind of comfortable to remain isolated in their own little worlds. Um, No need to interact except if there's a need to interact. Right. Right. Um, And then what's the need to interact that comes up? Um, let's see. He, he comes over to tell him that his garden is all a mess. Or that, do they just mention that, mention that as um, one of the reasons he came? Yep. Oh, his wife gets sick. Right, right. His That's wife right. gets sick. His wife gets and sick. And Parrish is lame, right? He, he has a, he, yeah, he has, he has a, lame, a leg. lame leg. Yeah. That's right. Um, so Parrish is like, I can't, first of all, I can't ride a bicycle. And second of all, I have a lame leg. So even if I could borrow your bicycle, I couldn't ride into town. Right. So I need you to ride into town and mm-hmm. fetch a doctor and then find somebody also to come repair the, the leak in my roof. Right, because right. they had all the, they had this windstorm, right? right? And these tiles had been blown off. And now water is pouring through their bedroom. Right. Right, onto his sick wife. And now, he, and so initially, um, before he asked him to go to the doctor, Nickel's like, okay, fine, I'll come over and help move your wife downstairs. Mm-hmm. Right, so she's not sitting in the bedroom where the water is leaking in. And Parrish is like, yeah, well, thanks, but uh, I kind of already did that. You know, yeah. I can't get upstairs anyway with my lame leg, so she's already downstairs. What I need you to do is go get the doctor and leave a note for the builders. That's right. Right. And not to mention, it's like torrential downpour and still windy outside. Like, the weather is horrible. Yeah. Right? And they live in the country. Yeah. So he's asking to ride into town, which is probably a great distance. Right. Right? And so, yeah, and so Niggle, it's like, that's the last thing I want to do is go spend time doing this but I'll do it because he's kind hearted and he's kind of been pushed to actually having to do something about his kind heartedness at this point right Um, you know and you think about that and it's like what would a what would a real like what would someone who's truly kind hearted not just someone who's like sort of kind hearted and feels bad for other people but doesn't really want to do anything about it what would a truly kind hearted person do you know you might think of like average people who feel bad about something happening to somebody else and then think about like you know, the, the truly kind-hearted person is like Mother Teresa, who actually right, like, goes yeah, and does something about all of the pain that people right. are going through, you know? Right. Um, like, you know, what is what is Niggle's response as compared to the truly kind-hearted person? I mean, basically, he says, I'm going to... I really don't want to make this my problem too much, so I'm just going to ride into town and tell people. You know, but you think about... I, I have to think that a truly kind-hearted person would you know maybe it's it's hard for me to say as someone who is 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 kind of a maker that i would like go and take some like artistic work i was working on and make that like that would be a very last resort for me to like patch a person's roof with that oh right. um but you know you might at least go over and be like okay now i can i find something to do the job you know to to right, get the job before done make, before riding right? into town yeah. yeah um but it's almost like niggle's reaction here is just like okay i'll do the bare minimum to make sure that they're taken care of, but I really don't want to make this my problem. I don't want to have to do anything more beyond this. You right. Know? Um, right. Which is, I know I can relate to that very heavily. You know, like, I even when I help people, and I'm like, oh, I'm doing a good deed. I'm helping this person. Like, I'm almost like, I hope it's over soon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I hope I don't have to go on helping this person much longer. Um, You're one of those people that, that offers to help somebody move and then secretly hopes that they won't need you. Right, yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, to, to be honest, I don't... Um, I feel like what Niggle did, like, even if he didn't have the best attitude about it, I feel mm-hmm. like it was very generous and it was very kind. And, you know, I try to put myself in that position, and I'm like, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. What would a truly high, kind, I mean, not that I'm calling myself truly kind-hearted, but, I mean, what what could you have done? I mean, if he didn't have any medical experience, it's not like he could go over there and be like, well, let me take a look at your wife and see if I can do anything to help, right? And he's mm-hmm. a very small man, so it's not like he could patch a roof. Um, you know, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about what... Like, what else could he have done? I feel like he did really the only thing he... I feel like he did the most helpful thing, given his yeah. position in life. Well, that's... And, but I think that's... Um, and, and the intent here is not necessarily to, like, cast a judgment on Diggle, but it's more to establish, like, where he 
exists on the spectrum, right? Of like mm. good person, bad person, right? Yeah. He's not just slamming the door in Paris's face and being like, "No, right. I refuse to help you. I've got I've got my painting to work on." Yeah. You know, he's he he knows that he has a duty towards Parrish. Right. And because Parrish is his neighbor. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though he's not particularly fond of, of Parrish, mm-hmm. he knows that he has to help him. And he really could just slam the door on him. In fact, if he had just slammed the door on him, um, he probably never would have gotten into trouble with the authorities, right? Because when he went and actually left a note with the builders... And I'm not exactly clear on that. Is the builder that shows up, like a, like the... Um, I don't think the builder ever shows up. That's an inspector. Yeah, the inspector. But I, I feel like that's tied to him having gone to the builder's office. You know? Oh, you think so? That's, that's I don't know. Let's Maybe I'm wrong jump, about let's that. Let's not jump ahead too much. We'll get there. Well, I, I don't feel like we're jumping ahead too much. No? Um, well, I wanted to say one other thing. Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. About, and I totally get what you're saying about where he is on the spectrum. You know, good person, bad person. And... Um, I think we could probably say he's, he's, you know, definitely closer to the end of good person. Right. Right. Um, but at the same time, he does say to himself, curse it. Yeah. As he gets on his bicycle. Right. You know, like, dang it, perish in your lame leg. Yeah. You know, and your sick wife. Ah! Right. I mean, but I also don't, I think that's also a very human response. Well, and I don't know that he's necessarily like, you know, Cursing Parish per se, and I think he's just hmm. like, ah. Oh. I think he's just frustrated. Yeah, it's you like, know, darn it, you know. This is not how I saw my day going. Right, exactly. Yeah. I've, it, we've all had days we like that where it's like, like, you know, that. you start out the day with the the grandest of intentions for all mm-hmm. the things you're going to accomplish mm-hmm. for all your little projects you've got going, and yep. by the end of the day, you're like, you know, all these little things came up, yeah. and and you didn't get any of the stuff accomplished that you wanted to accomplish. Right. So. So I think I think it's a very human, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like that response makes, you know, tilts him to the the bad end at all. I feel like that's a very human, a human response. Um, yeah, and, and and then to top it all off, you know, he gets back and um, it turns out. Uh, well, go ahead. It turns out that. It turns out they go get sick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Parrish's wife is like getting better. And, and, and she, funny she, she only is, had a cold. She only had a cold, which is right. what Niggle said to Paris. Right. She was like, "Oh, are you sure she doesn't have a cold? Doesn't have a cold? You know, maybe just try some chicken broth, you know, and some warm tea." And Paris like, "Oh no, no, I'm very worried." Mm-hmm. And it turns out, indeed, she does have a cold, and yeah. now does just have a cold. It's getting better now. Niggle is sick. Yeah, and now Niggle. And he's really sick. Like yeah. he has a fever. He's in bed for days. Yeah, right. and he's sitting there thinking of all the things he wants to make, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have the energy to actually go out and do it. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> so. And then his own roof began to leak. Right. And the builder didn't come. Right. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden, at that point, that's when the inspector of yes, houses shows up. Yes, the inspector up. comes. Yes. Um. So the inspector of houses basically says, um, "Hey, you know what? Um, I'm sorry. So the inspector of houses comes." Uh, starts giving Niggle a hard time um, and says basically, hey, you should have used your painting to yeah, patch up He's giving Niggle a hard Paris's time roof. about the state of his, his neighbor's house. Right. <laughs> if I were Niggle, I'd be like, it's his house, like right. not mine. Since, you know, since when, when am I the keeper of my neighbor's house? Yeah. Right? But yeah, and then the inspector has the, has the guts to tell him, you know, you have all this canvas laying around. You should have patched his roof with that can, you know, with the canvas. Right. Right. How insulting. Right. So, um, uh, shortly after, you know, just basically right from there, it's almost like this this news. It's like, since you didn't do this, now you have to go to the work, um, uh, to the work house or and the so work So do you farm. think he's basically being punished for going to the builder? Is that what you were saying? That you think the inspector coming is tied to... Nigel well, going to see the, go, leaving a note for the builder? Yeah, I, it says he's an inspector of houses, so, um... It almost seems like maybe he, you know, maybe the builder let him in on it or something like that. Maybe, like maybe the builder sent him out to, um, to let, to like inspect the house and see how it was, you know, and see if it really needed repairs. Um, so I'm almost thinking that if Niggle had not done that and said something to the builder of houses, he wouldn't be in this predicament now. Oh, it's almost like he'd okay. still be there working on his painting, you know. 
So, so it's basically... Like, because Niggle does something kind-hearted. Okay. Now... Uh, that that's the way I read it. Um, that may not be. I hadn't thought of that. But... That may not be the most precise reading, but that's the way I read it. Okay. Um, but Niggle goes does this thing, and it kind of almost comes back to get <laughs> because he now he has to go off to the to the workhouse uh, to the workhouse infirmary. Okay. Um, well, the reason he has to go to the workhouse though is because he has he doesn't have any. Um... I'm sorry. Yes, he goes on the journey, and then he forgets his. He loses his luggage on the train, and right. then he has to go to the workhouse. Right. Exactly. So the inspector says, "Okay, now you you need to go. The driver is here for you." And yes. he's like, and they were like, what is going on?" And he because he didn't have time to pack. All he had was this little bag in the hallway that only had, which I thought was very appropriate, only had what like a few paints and a paintbrush in it. I'm right. like, well, that's, that's all he needs, right? Right. But then, yeah, he gets on. He, so he takes his little bag of paint and a paintbrush, gets on the train, and then when he gets off the train, he loses his bag. Yeah. And so because he has no luggage, he has to go to the workhouse. Right. Right. The workhouse, in, and he has to go to the infirmary because he's still recovering mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from his illness. Yeah, I start to get this very like. Um, I, I get this very like World War Two era vibe from all of this. Like this is like this feels very. Like he's entering, you know, he was in this free, living this free life, and now he's entering this very bureaucratic mm. world where it's like you're going to be put on the train and taken to the workhouse so you can be a productive member of society. You know, um, it, it almost has starts to have this uh, just a slight tinge of like an Orwellian or Orwellian feel here. Okay. You know, yeah, like, yeah, I can see um, that. Like with, uh, you know, Big Brother is watching over everything, and he's going to ensure you're a productive member of society. You know. Um, you will give back, darn it. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, just after he enters the workhouse, it says, at first, during the first century or so, yes. <laughs> I'm merely giving, giving his impressions, he used to worry aimlessly about the past. Um, I wish I had called on Paris the first morning after the high winds began. I meant to. The first loose tiles would have been easy to fix. Then Mrs. Parrish might never have caught cold. Then I should not have caught cold either. Then I should have had, then I should have had a week longer. Um, so, but I, I I love that little for after the first century or so. Yeah, you know, in the workhouse, like to me, that's Tolkien, like um, almost giving a little a very clear hint into what the point of this story is. Um, and you know that that comes back to that whole notion when he called it purgatorial, right? Yes. That, yes. Wherever wherever Niggle is now, uh, there's something very uh, purgatorial about it. You know, right. I think uh, um, uh, purgatory is one of those things that I kind of the 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 exact the the understanding of it or something like that is something I haven't read about in a long time. But um, but my understanding is that there's like this teaching on purg like the, part of the teaching on purgatory is that it it almost speaks in terms of long periods of time like this, and it's not necessarily supposed to be the way we would perceive time now but it's almost like it's almost like a way of explaining what it feels like to be in in purgatory mm, right and yeah. so it, it's probably worthwhile for those for those who aren't familiar with um like deeply familiar with the catholic teaching on purgatory it's probably appropriate to talk a little bit about that because tolkien was catholic and so um he called this a purgatorial story what exactly did he mean by that and so the question is, well, what did Tolkien mean by purgatory? Um, for Tolkien, as a Catholic, purgatory would have been um, not not hell at all. No. Purgatory is, in purgatory, um, you're definitely going to heaven, right? Right. Um, you are, there, there is no doubt in, anyone's, in, in, in any way, shape, or form that you are going to eventually wind up in heaven when you're in purgatory. Um Nevertheless, purgatory is a place of cleansing, and it's a place of uh, it's it's not a happy place. It's it's not a it's not a fun place to be in, no. right? It's like it's, a refiner's it, fire. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a purification process. Exactly. It's a place of purification, a place of cleansing. Yeah. Um, and you get rid of all your vices. Exactly. It's 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 where you finally rid yourself of all the unhealthy attachments and everything you have. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Um, I think that's important to remember because I have a feeling that if Niggle had, you know, Niggle was going to go on this journey no matter what. Right. He had this journey going no matter mm-hmm. what. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling that if he hadn't made the bike ride, 
he wouldn't have been going to the workhouse in the first place. He would have been like, you know, dumped in the ocean. I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, the, the corollary for going, going to hell would have been in this story. But like, you know, I don't think, I don't, I don't think he would have been going to the workhouse in that case. Right. I think because he showed the kindness to niggle or to perish that he did, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't like this great, like overflowing altruistic kindness, mm-hmm. um, he still he still tried, right? Right. Even though it annoyed the, right the heck out of him, yeah. He still did the action, right? Right. Um, and, and the other part of it is that is that true love consists in action, right? So he did the action. He did the loving thing. It wasn't completely loving because he was still like, "Er, mm-hmm. can't believe I have to do this." Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. nevertheless, he 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 made kind of the heroic effort. Uh, to do what he could. Right. You know? Right. Um, so the inspector showing up was actually a good thing. The fact that, because the effect, because he left the note yeah. at the builders, which pointed the inspector to his house, so at least the way that you're reading it, and the inspector was basically the guy that was, if and the inspector showed up, then that was a good thing, because it meant that you were eventually going to end up in heaven. Well, I don't know, I don't know if the, if the inspector means that or not. The inspector might even just be a, a way of saying the well it might be like the driver is the better one the driver is the one taking him on the long journey right or starting him on the long journey mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure how to read the inspector in that way I, again I think we should not try too hard to read a symbol like an allegorically because even yeah. Tolkien himself was not 100% did, did not say that this was an allegory 100% right if it was an allegory we could do that okay. but but because it's not we we can only say this is very similar you know, okay. to uh, to this thing. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know sense. how I would read the the building inspector in that sense, but actually, I think the building inspector comes back up later in the story and is given a name. Um, oh, is that the same character? I think it is. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm gonna jump ahead real quick. Um, because and maybe the maybe the inspector was just an agent of this pretend, particular person. Um, but anyway, um, we okay. can we can come back to that. Yeah. Uh, when Let's we get there. That. Um, so this feels, this feels very purgatorial. Like he's going through this, un, he's in this unpleasant place, mm-hmm. um, in order to be cleansed of all the things that, you know, he's doing wrong. And you see him reflecting on his actions. He's like, I yes. wish I had done this, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. And why is he saying, I wish I had done this right then? What, what's his reason for saying all of that? The last thing he says in that little quote. Then I should have had a week longer. Right. Oh man, I wish that I had helped perish sooner because if I had, I could have actually completed my painting, right. right? That is not the completion of love right there. That is not him being completely and thoroughly refined to a truly loving individual who always does what's in the interest of the other person first. Right. You know, um, that's him saying, Parrish is so annoying. If I had just helped him first, I could have had, had more time to work on my painting. Right. It's like he's still missing the big picture there. Yeah. You know? He's yes, still he he's, he's he's still kind of down in the details, missing the big picture of why he's there in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so he spends some more time um, in uh, in in this in this workhouse, the workhouse infirmary, um, and it's just well, kind of this dark and dingy place. Well, Go what's ahead. funny is that right after he said, the right after he says, "Then I should have had a week longer." The next sentence is, "But in time, he forgot." what it was that he had wanted a week longer for. Yes. Um, so you start to see like this little bit of glimmering hope, mm-hmm. you know, that, that he's, he's start, like he's at least starting to let go. Right. And be cured of some of these attachments. Right. Right. And then it says if he worried at all after that, it wasn't, it wasn't about the past, but it was about the jobs mm-hmm. that he had the hospital. So he's kind of moved on from his worry about the past to just, what do I have to do today? Right. right. Living in the present. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so you can see, in a sense, why he's there. Because it's helping yeah. him to start forget about... He's starting to forget about the thing that was his kind of thing that he was... That was super important to him. Mm-hmm. And starting to... Because he's forgetting about that, it's like emptying him and making him able to have a bigger perspective. Right. You know? Right. Um now, he's still not enjoying himself. I yeah. mean, it's still, it says no. he has no pleasure in anything. Yeah, he got no pleasure out of life, not what he had not what he had been used to call pleasure. Right. He was certainly not amused. Uh, but it could not be denied that he began to have a feeling of satisfaction 
bread rather than jam. Hmm. Um, he would he could take up a task the moment one bell rang and lay it aside promptly the moment the next one went, all tidy and ready to be continued at the right time. Um, so you know you see him kind of coming along in whatever yeah. way he's supposed mm-hmm. to be coming along. Yeah, um, you see him changing. Yes, you see him yeah. changing, kind of loosening up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then um, it's you know at one point much later on he's lying in the dark and he starts to overhear this conversation about himself. Yes. Uh, between two voices. Yep. The first voice is a severe voice, more severe than the doctor's, and the second voice is a um, uh, was a gentle kind of voice of authority. Um, and you know, if you know, again, if reading this is purgatory, I have a hard time not viewing these voices as kind of, um, it's, it, especially viewing the second voice as Christ. I don't, I don't, because mm-hmm. he's the advocate, right? That yes. he's he's pleading on his behalf. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly how to read the first voice. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I could theorize about it, but I don't want to get too bogged down in that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I'm interested if any of our listeners have a theory on that, what they would say about the first voice. Yeah. Um, but the second voice, I feel very confident, is meant to be representative of of Christ uh, because he's an, he's the advocate. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but he's the one who says, you know, what was the matter with Niggle? His heart was in the right place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Which it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the first voice says, yes, but it did not function properly. And his, as, and his head was not screwed on tight enough. He hardly ever thought at all. Look at the time he wasted, not, not even amusing himself. He never got ready for his journey. He was moderately well off, and yet he arrived here almost destitute and had to be put in the pauper's wing. A bad case, I'm afraid. I think he should stay some time yet. Um, and, and the second voice continues to plead on his behalf. Um, uh, and they, they kind of go back and forth for a little while. Um, the painting comes back to the mind. The second voice brings up the painting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even even says that his works, hey, his paintings, you know, had a little bit of merit of their own. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then the second voice says, still there is this last report, that wet bicycle ride. I'd rather lay stress on that. It seems plain that this was a genuine sacrifice. Niggle guessed that he was throwing away his last chance with his picture, and he guessed too that Parrish was worrying unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. And the first voice um, still kind of takes issue with that, thinking you put it you put it too strongly. Um, but the second voice basically comes back and says, "I think this is a time for gentle treatment." Yeah. Um, I love what it says after that about gentle treatment. Um, Niggle thought that he had never heard anything so generous as that second voice. It made gentle treatment sound like a load of rich gifts and the summons to a king's feast. Then suddenly Niggle felt ashamed. To hear that he was considered a case for gentle treatment overwhelmed him and made him blush in the dark. It was like being publicly praised when you and all the audience knew that the praise was not deserved. Niggle had his blushes in the rough blanket. Um, and so finally, you know, they kind of pull back the curtain and they talk to him and they say, um, and the first voice says, um, what do you have to say for yourself, basically? Mm-hmm. You've been mm-hmm. listening to all this. What do you have to say for yourself? And what does Niggle say? He asked about Parrish. Yeah. Yep. He said, I'd really like to see him. I hope he's not very sick. Can you cure his leg? Um, you know, he was a very good neighbor. He gave me excellent potatoes. Very cheap. Saved me a lot of time. So that's, you know, that's very telling, too, of mm-hmm. the change that has, has happened in Niggle. Because when they ask him, you know, well, what do you have to say? Right. You know, his first thought is, oh, please, you know, save me. I've... You know, I'm tired of being here. Let me move on. You know, right. it was instead it was asking after his his neighbor. Right. You know, you can right. see that that his his uh, focus has shifted. Yeah, right? and you can see in himself that like his response to hearing the good things that the second voice said about himself said about him was, um, you know, he was almost like hum- he was like he he was almost like ashamed. He was almost like humbled. He was like. Yeah. He can't possibly be speaking about me. Like, I'm not a good person, you mm-hmm. know? Like, yeah, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what, what are these What are these kind things that this voice is saying about me? You know, this mm-hmm. this person is saying about me mm-hmm. right here. Mm-hmm. Um, he almost just can't believe it. And you think about that in the process he's gone through of, of being emptied and just getting to the point where he just forgets about everything that used to have this hold on his, this grip on his heart right. and, and, and his life. 
and he's just forgotten about all that. Mm-hmm. And at this point, he's just like, I just want to know how Paris is doing. You know, yes. um, I really yeah. hope he's doing well. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's mm-hmm. just beautiful. That is absolutely you know? beautiful. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's something. I mean, I hope all of us as human beings arrive at is this place where we're just like everything else that matters to us. The thing at the end of the day, we just want to know is how's that person I used to maybe maybe even be annoyed by. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's just to find this place where, in the depths of your heart, you actually think fondly of and care for that person mm-hmm. you know yeah um uh, just just truly a, truly a beautiful um little picture there yes um and then they say he kind of, it's almost like though he without even intending to he almost like passes a test yeah and they're basically yes. like all right he can move to the next stage yeah um so um um next stage what happens in the next stage? Um, he uh, he gets to see sunshine yeah. again, uh, which is definitely a contrast to the dark, dingy place that he had been. Um, and he gets on another train. Yeah. And um, it's an empty coach. And he says that the um, it's a small little engine, right? It's just mm-hmm. a coach. Um, it's one coach and a small engine, and they both look like brand new. Right. I like this was their maiden voyage. Right. Right? And uh, he's the only one. He's the only one on the train. And he asks them where the, he asks the porter, where are we going? And he's like, oh, I don't think they've named it yet. Right. Right? And so he's in this train for a little while. Um, and then he uh, he's, you know, enjoying the scenery, right? Green banks, blue sky. Um, and then there was no station where he was let off. It was just... Um, it was a green embankment, and there was a, a little hedge and a gate. And on yes. the gate, it says "niggle." Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and he and goes. His bike is there. Yeah, he his finds his bike, and he goes. He goes kind of riding, and I just I love this. I love this scene because he's been in this workhouse forever, and mm-hmm. just this dark place, and then he's finally out in the sunshine, mm-hmm. and he just rides down this out of hill. Nature. Um, you see him like uh, you can almost see him like lifting his yeah exactly like that's his, that's exactly my picture off the pedals and just you know yeah Wee! yeah um, it's all I I I could see if, if if there's ever a movie made of this I can see this scene already mm-hmm. you know it's just like mm-hmm. he's riding down this hill you know just like with this sense of abandon yes um you know happy to be free of the previous place mm-hmm. um, and then he hits the bottom of the hill mm-hmm. um and he looks up and. There's the shadow that overcomes between him and the, and the sun, and he looks up, and there's his tree. His tree. Yeah. Finished. Yeah. If you could say that, if uh, before him stood the tree, his tree finished. If you could say that of a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Nigel had so often felt or guessed, and had so often failed to catch, he gazed at the tree and slowly he lifted his arms and opened them wide. It's a gift, he said. He was referring to his art and also to the result. But he was using the word quite literally, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you What do you do with that? It's a gift. Like, what What does that just little short paragraph there mean to you? Well, it shows you how much his art meant to him, and how much, um, you know, how much he had wanted to finish that, mm-hmm. and how much he because it was obviously a very clear picture in his mind and something he wanted very badly to be able to express and get out and now to see it here mm-hmm. you know completed and in a way glorified yeah you know um i think it i think it just it just it means so much to him it's almost completes him in a way right um it's something that he wasn't able to do for himself and now it's like someone you know took it upon themselves to finish it and present it to him right yeah um it's uh it's it's like this is all of that stuff he went through in the house because he finally kind of got it because the the switch flipped. Mm-hmm. Um, he he has been given this thing. He's been given this opportunity to actually have his his work given back to him, but yes. completed and yes. perfected, you yes. know, and made alive, made mm-hmm. real. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, what's interesting about this though is. Um, uh, you know, I wrote one of the times when I read this. Um, I wrote just a couple of paragraphs before 
as he's riding down the hill, I wrote next to it, heaven. Because I assumed mm. that this was uh, that this was heaven. Mm. But when I was reading it this time, I started to think, you know, I don't think... I don't think it's heaven yet. I don't think it's heaven either. Um, well, why? So, so why did you come to that realization? Why did you come to that thought? Um, well, first of all, because um, because there's still work for him to do there, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the tree is finished, right? Um, but um, but there's still, you know, he's looking around, and he sees the forest, right? And um, there's, you know, there's kind of some overgrown overgrown weeds and you know such and um and there's he needs to work like he sees yes ways that he can improve this place right Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what got me thinking that it wasn't heaven was because there's still work for him to do Mm -hmm. right um now it's not the hard you know fixing table legs and you know scrubbing floors on hands and knee that he was doing in the other place right? right this is more of the work that he enjoys and it's also interesting too because um, it's not the work that he would prefer to do, right? It's not painting. Right. It's actually taking care, you know, how his garden was always a mess at home, mm-hmm. right? And now he's looking at this messy forest and saying, I need to fix that. So it's mm-hmm. almost like he's getting a second chance to, you know, because he always neglected his garden at home. And now it's like, okay, let's see what you can do with this. Right. You know? Um, and so he... Uh, so it's it's still work, right? I mean, it's outside and it's in a beautiful environment, but it's still work, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and I think in part of what led me to that conclusion too is that just a little bit after all of this, Paris shows up. Uh, well, doesn't it say before that too that he notices? And this I thought was a little curious. I was interested interested to get your take on it. Uh-huh. He's looking at the tree and he's looking at, of course, the leaves of the tree, and um, he was saying how exquisite they are. And he says, yet they are they were dated as clear as a calendar. Yes. Some of the most beautiful and the most characteristic, the most perfect examples of the Niggle style were seen to have been produced in collaboration with Mr. Parrish. Yeah. There is no other way of putting it. And that I did not quite understand because I don't I didn't know what that meant. Um because Parrish never helped him paint. Right. Right? Parrish never, you know, they, they were never, and we even talked earlier how they didn't get each other. Right. Right? So I was, what do you, did you, did that, um, you know, did, did you have any thoughts on that? No, about... I picked up on that too, and I thought it was odd. I, um, uh, I mean, of course, Parrish, like I said, shows up here in just a, in just a bit. So um, it was, I guess I kind of forgot about it and discounted it um Mm -hmm. my only thought is that maybe it's what it's saying is that the times that they interacted that the leaves are almost like those leaves almost represent times they interacted in a in a positive way you know Hmm. like where they were helpful to one another um okay and um uh, okay okay that makes sense that makes sense and it could also just be a way of showing that he's realizing yeah his need Right for help for companionship. Right and and yeah and for and for friendship and for um, and, and and to show love to another person right mm-hmm. to other to to other people. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, begins to think about. How... I mean, I mean, this almost makes me think of um, that all of our works are in a way you know just they're they're products of love in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's in one of the. Um, in one of St. Paul's epistles, he talks about um, he talks about um, works that are not. Uh, I, I should have had this in front of me. But he, he, t- he talks about works that are not um, made of a certain substance will be burned up, right? If they're if they're just made of like hay or straw, they're going to be burned up. But if they're made of the right material, they'll last the fire, you know. Hmm. And and so the you know really the material he's referring to is that our works are founded in love, right, mm-hmm. in true love. You know, and those are the ones that will last. Yeah, those fire. are the ones that will last, and so mm-hmm. it's almost like the more the the instances where he was doing things to help added to this tree that was his passion, right? Mm-hmm. Even though he thought they were just taking away from him being able to work on this, these were became the most beautiful leaves oh, in the tree. Okay, right? Okay. Um, these be, these became the greatest, you know, the greatest products of beauty of his work. Um, yeah, that's very cool. So, um, uh, but I'm gonna jump ahead to Parish. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it was interesting too because that's um, you know because he's sitting down and he's noticing that all this work needs to be done in the forest, but he can't quite figure out right what or how to do it. And then he realizes before he even sees Parrish, he realizes yes. oh, what I need is Parrish. Right, I need Parrish. Yeah. I've been so blind. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so Parrish, um, uh, Parrish, he he basically walks to a certain place and sees Parrish. Right. Mm-hmm. He he walk he's walking about in this land. And, and and so I think we forgot to mention, not only is there the tree here, but like every, all of the mountain, like the countryside that he had starting to kind of sketch around the tree yes. has now been given its own reality too. So he's right. like, it's not just that there's this tree, it's that there's this huge countryside mm-hmm. that he's, that he's dwelling in now. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful countryside. In the, in the background. Too. All of the stuff that he just barely sketched yeah. and it's all become real. Yes. Um, you know, he's like, the mountains are there. He He's like, I could walk to those mountains, mm-hmm, you know, if I needed mm-hmm, to. Mm-hmm. But it still doesn't fi- quite feel complete. And right. so he finds like he Parrish. Says that he needs, um, what does he say? He actually says it needed some, some thought and yes. some work. But he couldn't quite figure out what to do. And then right. Parrish fake fat, shows up. Yeah. And, um, and so Parrish shows up. Uh, and it says, they did not speak, just nodded as they used to do, passing in the lane. Mm-hmm. But now they walked about together, arm in arm. Without talking, Niggle and Parrish agreed exactly where to make the small house and garden, which seemed to be required. They get each other. Yeah. And this is where I, this is what I really like. As they worked together, it became plain that Niggle was now the better of the two at ordering his time and getting things done. Oddly enough, it was Niggle who became most absorbed in building and gardening, while Parrish often wondered about looking at trees, and especially at the tree. Hmm. And what I love about that is that it feels like you know, the nature of true love is to see through the other's eyes. It's to uh, see through the other person's yes, eyes. Yes. Um, to truly feel and to and to have all of your senses overwhelmed by um, by their perspective, right? Indeed. Yes. Um, you know, that is so hard to get as a human being, like to to be able to see a, another person's reality through their eyes. Mm-hmm. But it's like to be able to do so it seems like one of the greatest steps of wisdom you can possibly take you know absolutely um and i love the fact that they are actually seeing um seeing this this creation that they are now embarking on jointly through each other's eyes and they're Mm -hmm. like they're they're doing they're they're taking an interest in the other's work yes you know Um, which was so not even the case when you know before right when they were neighbors right um uh so uh, a little bit later, Parrish, they've been working, they've been working, and then um, Parrish says, this is grand. I oughtn't to be here, really. Thank you for putting in a word for me. Right? So mm. um, Parrish is like, you know, hey, Nickel, you, you helped me out with by putting in a word for me at, at the um, at the place by saying, you know, that you cared for me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's in, by inquiring about me. I might have been forgotten otherwise. Yeah. You know? Yeah, thanks um, for mentioning my potatoes, dude. Right. Um <laughs> Uh, but he, but Niggle says, you know, we owe it to the second voice. You owe it to the second voice. We both do, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so again, like I, I just again, I think that ties back again and, and makes the case stronger that the second voice seems to refer to uh, Christ or is a Christ figure at the right. very least. Well, even says know? too before when those first and second voice are talking, the first voice even says to the second voice, "Well, you have the final word." Right. You know, so that that makes it even, I think, more clear that that's definitely that's intended to be. Right. <clears throat> um, and then they yeah. start using this tonic. Does that have any significance to you? I was a bit perplexed by that. They were each given this bottle, right, of tonic, and it says a few drops to be taken in water from the sp- from the spring before resting. And it says that that so they would add these few drops to the water, and it would made it made the water bitter. Mm-hmm. But invigorating, and it cleared the head. Right. Well, I mean, I think I think um, the bitterness probably just reinforces that they're still in uh, purgatory. Yes. But and they need sustenance. Yeah, but it's like they've moved on to a to a brighter to a place of purgatory that's much closer to heaven. You know, it's kind of like this. I think this 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 has very clear echoes of Dante's view of purgatory, where it's these different different mm-hmm. levels ascending into heaven. Um, and as you get closer to heaven, you know, the things that people are going through are less, um, less daunting, you yes. know, less, less unpleasurable, I guess you could say, gotcha. you know, they're almost in this level that's like quasi heaven, you know, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not quite heaven, 
but it's 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 pretty beautiful, and they seem to be enjoying themselves. Right. You know. Right. They're making um, progress. They're going in the right direction. So so it's almost like that bitterness may be a little reminder that they're not quite there they're yet. Not quite there yet. Uh, but yeah. they get healed. You know, Paris is Paris yeah, loses his Paris limp. Yeah, Paris lost his limp. Yep. And they seem to be getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, yeah, so they they continue you know, continue on continue working, and um, uh, one day they're kind of walking along, and they walk to the edge of kind of their little region there, and they see this man who looks like a shepherd, yes. um, and, you know, again very strong Christ figure yes, uh, the connotations good there, the mm-hmm. good shepherd. Um, he was walking towards them down the grass slopes that led up into the mountains. Do you want a guide? He asked. Do you want to go on? Uh, and then a shadow falls between them. Um, Niggle does. He he senses that he he has to go on. Right. It says that actually. This was before that even that he finds himself looking more and more toward the mountains. Right. Yeah. 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 He he feels like he's ready to move on. Yes. And um, and he asks Parrish. He's hoping Parrish wants to move on too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says Parrish says no. I must wait for my wife. Right. You know. And I love this notion that in the end it like that this thing that began with just this little leaf that Niggle was making has become basically this place of healing for Niggle, Parrish, and his wife. You know, that, that all three of them now are going to be healed by this place, you know, mm-hmm. and brought to um, brought to their perfection by this place, you know. That's just a beautiful... That is, um, and again, it speaks to that, because that, a leaf maybe that was, you know, um, that was drawn by somebody who, you know, who... who uh, wasn't maybe the best of people, right? Mm-hmm. And leaf that leaves that were drawn without probably the best attitude. Yes. Right? Are now being used to to heal. Right. Because they've been glorified, right? They've been perfected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um so um he he asked them asked, where they are. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can you tell me the name of this country? Can you tell me the name of this place? And Parish asks, right? Yeah. Like, can you, can, and then the man's like, Don't you know? Right? It's Niggle's country. It is mm-hmm. Niggle's picture. Or most of it. A little of it is now Parrish's garden. Right. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, you know, their their names are being attached to it. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, we, we, we almost get the sense that we're coming to this fi- point of finality with it. But there's still, you know, there's still a little bit more to go. Yeah. Um, I love the little thing, though. I didn't know what um, dabbing meant. Yeah, I didn't either. So I looked that up, and apparently, let's just think of dab, right? It's like a dab I of paint. I was wondering if that's you know? what it was, yeah. Um, it's like, just like, oh, your little scribble, or your little pl- mm-hmm. your little plop of paint that you put mm-hmm. on as canvas, you know? Yeah, I um, love I love this part of the story. Uh, you know, Nig- Parrish says to Niggle, Niggle, you thought of all this? I, you, I didn't know you were so clever. Why didn't you tell me? Right? right. And the man says, I love that Niggle doesn't respond to him, but the man does. Yes. He says he tried. You know, he mm-hmm. tried to tell you, and you just you couldn't see. You know, all you saw was a mess of, you know, scribbly paint on a canvas, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and Parrish is like, well, it it didn't look this. It didn't look like this. You right. know, it didn't look this real. And again, like it's that thing of seeing like Niggle saw all of this. Like he he could right. see all of this in his mind. It. Yes. And that's why he was trying to to make it, mm-hmm. and that's why it was so important for him to, for him to make it. Yes. And then, but. Parish couldn't see it, but yeah. now they see through each other's eyes, and so it, it changes everything. You know, it's like right. if you know, it, it just makes me wonder. Like, if we take the moment to to look, especially at the things that people do through their eyes, how would it change our perspective mm-hmm. um, and our understanding mm-hmm. and our and our sympathy towards them? Right. You know? Yeah, I think that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, and I and I also think too, you know, what the man says here. You know, he's like, well, you know, back then it was only a glimpse, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you, you might have caught the glimpse if you'd ever thought it worth a, a worthwhile to try. Right. You know? Um, but that, too, just that whole idea of a glimpse, it, it reminded me of the, in the Silmarillion, of the music of the Einar, you know, and of the vision. Right. And that, um, that the, um, um, because of the glimpse, yeah. Yeah, the glimpse. It was, it was almost like a vision. Yeah. Right. I the mean, glimpse was, of what was to come. Yeah. 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 And you know that got that got the uh, got the um, 
the Valar so excited, you know, to mm-hmm. build this world for the, the children of the of the Luvatar. Right. Right? And they get there, and they're like, wait, it's not here. Right. You know? I mean, wait, we have to do it? You know? Yeah. Um, but that, but the, and, but, and, and even there, they're intended to work together to make right, it happen. Right, exactly. You know? It's like they need each other. And when they, they don't, alone. problems happen. You right, know? when they try to... Right, when they try to insert their own desires and their own their own ideas of what this vision is supposed to be, that's when trouble mm-hmm. starts, right? And that's why Parrish and Niggle, you know, never got each other because they kept trying to, they were inserting their own, right. you know, presuppositions and their own worldviews into what the other, you know, into the others. And mm-hmm. instead of seeing it from that other person's perspective. Right, right. And I think that's something that's so easy to do. You know, I mean, I do it all the time. I put mm-hmm. my own, my own personal, you know, issues and, you know, assumptions, right, and into things that I read, and mm-hmm. you know, can, you can totally misinterpret. Well, we all do. It's hard. Point. It's hard to break out of your hard own perspective, mm-hmm. you know, and to, mm-hmm. and it's hard to it's hard to change your gut instinct or work against your gut instinct, which is always to say, "Protect me," and. It's what it's about what I see, right? And to say, well, what does the other person see? Right. You know, yes. What is how does the other person feel about this? Because maybe if I took time to understand that first, mm-hmm. um, or before I even made a response, I would actually see something that would that would totally change my mind. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, yes. So um, ah, just so much, so much I wisdom know. in this. I know. Um, uh, so. Um, they have to part. They Go ahead. Do. I was, I was yeah. just going to say, I like what Niggles says to Parrish, too. You know, Parrish is like, oh, man, I never saw it. I'm so sorry. Yeah. You know, and Niggles like, well, you know, it's not like Niggles is like, well, you're lost, you know? Yeah. Instead, he's like, well, you know, he puts it on himself, right? Yeah. He, he, he he blames himself. He says, I never I never gave you much of a chance. Yeah. You know, I never tried to explain it. What do you, what do you think about where he says things might have been different, but they could have, they could not have been better? Yeah, I thought that was curious. Yeah. I thought that was curious. I wonder if he's thinking about things, because um, he realizes that um, where they are now is due to how they were then. Yeah. Right? That it's yeah. connected. So if things it's, had been different then, then things would be different now. Yeah, it's almost like this um, oh, happy fault kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, mm-hmm. the you know the, the the old saying that even though even though death and evil and sin are reality, um, they are not the end of the story. And even though those things happen, it's not that they make things more sad. And that's, that's the, that's the period. It's, uh, that's, that's the period on the end of the tale. It's that because those things happened, there'll be even more love and grace and beauty and greatness to abound and glory to abound, you know? Um, and it'll be, make the good that much right that much right. better you know it'll make the good appear that much you know that much clearer and well but also because much, it, it it provides these opportunities for for heroism and for change and for um for opportunities to do good yeah yeah, yeah. um so you know just Again, a beautiful, a beautiful little glimpse, and I'm I'm glad to hear that they're you know. Then Niggle says, um, "We shall meet again. I expect there must be many more things we can do together." Um, so they say goodbye, but it's not a final goodbye. They expect to meet again, mm-hmm. um, and then and then Niggle walks off with the shepherd, and Parrish stays behind. Right. Uh, he was going to learn about sheep in the high pasturages and look at a wider sky and walk ever further and further towards the mountains, always uphill. Um, beyond that, I cannot guess what became of him. Uh, it's kind of funny at the end of C.S. Lewis's um, uh, uh, the last of C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, uh, the last battle. Um, I think there's there's it's kind of this big um, apocalyptic battle, and then um, and then there's kind of a new heavens and a new earth scene, and and I think he talks about further up and further in, uh, like he uses the term further up and further in as a way of saying like you know what what will that be like like you know to to be in this eternal place where there's just happiness and you're just, you're learning about everything. And there's just this end to all the things that there's no end to all the things that you love mm-hmm. to do. And, um, and what will it be like? And he uses this very poetic term further up and further in. Hmm. And, um, 
Uh, and I can't help but think that this, since this was written well before that, and they were such good friends, that maybe he kind of that stuck this whole that thing that um, that Tolkien says here stuck with him, where he says, um, uh, "Where does he say it? Walk further, 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 walk ever further, further and further towards the mountains, always, always uphill, uphill. You know, further up and further, further up and further in. Yeah, that reminds me of that a whole lot. So yeah, I can see why. I almost wonder if he was if um, Tolkien was reading this to the Inklings, and then and then Lewis is like, "Oh, further, further up." Further up and further in, yeah. <laughs> you know. We have to squirrel that one away. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So. Uh, so the story with with um, with Niggle and his, you know, where he, where we leave him. Yeah. Basically, is he's um, he's not in the mountains yet. Yes. Right. I mean, he's he's walking toward them. And it says he has a little house, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he could glimpse the mountains far away. They got into the borders of his picture. Mm-hmm. But what they are really like and what lies beyond them, only those who's, only those can say who have climbed them. Yeah. So he's not in the mountains yet. See, I, I, I just assumed that the mountains were heaven. Yeah. And so is this saying, maybe I'm wrong, but is this saying, is Niggle still not in heaven? I don't know, I, and, and I'm not entirely sure that we're meant to know at this point, like yeah. what exactly that represents. I think um, it could just be a further on stage, but it seems like this seems very final, and it and it does seem very final. That's yeah. why I was a little. So maybe the mountains aren't heaven, or well, maybe it's maybe just that whole region is heaven. You know, I mean, again, you think about it in terms mm-hmm. of Dante, like paradise has its own circles too, yeah. its own yeah. regions that True. go further and further up. You know. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. Interesting okay. question. Yeah. Um, so to the, the last little bits, a uh, cup two, there's two scenes that play out, um, after we're done with, with Parrish and Niggle. Um, first of all, there's this, uh, chat between Counselor Tompkins and Atkins, who are these two bureaucrats, I guess, from the town, mm-hmm. uh, that, that Parrish and Niggle lived outside of. And, um, and these guys, like, like I, I almost think of like Counselor Topkins as like some kind of like like Nazi or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know? I kind of got that feeling too. Yeah. yeah, like that he's he's like just some of the things he says. He's like uh, worthless. In fact, no use to society at all. He's speaking of Nickel. He mm-hmm. says no practical or economic use. I dare say he could have been made into a serv- serviceable cog of some sort if you schoolmasters knew your business, but you don't, and so we get useless people of this sort. If I ran this country, I should put him and his like to some job that they're fit for, washing dishes in a communal kitchen or something, and I should see that they did it properly, or I would put them away. I should have put him away long ago. And I, I, when I hear that voice, I hear this thing that Tolkien just absolutely rebelled against, and it was this whole, like, you know, talk of efficiency and of and kind of this totalitarian mindset that the state is going to run everything. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and will make it perfect and efficient and everyone will be doing the right thing that they're supposed to be doing and everything will be in its right place and there will be no misuse of any resources whatsoever. And everything is just viewed in this extremely utilitarian fashion, yes. you know, yes. um, that it's just about the usefulness of things, including mm-hmm. human beings, you know. Yes. Niggle should have been washing dishes. That's what he was useful for, you know. He could have been washing dishes in a communal kitchen. No and doing, spirit of creativity whatsoever, right? Right. And right. It's just what is practical. And, and, and ex- exactly, and no sense of like he's a human being, you right. know. No dignity. Yeah. No, no dignity creati- whatsoever. No creativity and no dignity. Yeah. Um, uh, Atkins stands up for him a little bit, and and it's Atkins who had who had preserved a little snippet, one leaf from from the painting uh, that they found. Right. Um, I love what Tompkins says, though, again. Of course, painting has uses, but you couldn't make use of his painting. There's plenty of scope for bold young men not afraid of new ideas and new methods. None for this old-fashioned stuff. Right. Private daydreaming. He could not have designed a telling poster to save his life. You know, telling poster, well, he's saying, you know, basically he's talking about like propaganda. Right. You know? Like, right. He's Which, talk- in his mind, would be a practical use, right? right? Yeah. Of this, of this skill. Yeah. Always yeah. fiddling with leaves and flowers. I asked him why once. He said he thought they were pretty. Can you believe it? He said pretty. Ugh, four letter word. <laughs> what? Digestive and genital organs of plants? <laughs> I said to him. Yeah, so he's referring to flowers there. Oh my goodness. There, you know? like, wow. It's, it's uh, well, flowers and stems, well, I guess. But I guess if you're speaking practically, that's what we exactly, are. Exactly, exactly. You know, that's, that's really all like, they are. It's like for the util- utilitarian Nazi bureaucrat, mm-hmm. that's what a flower is, right? Yeah. It's yeah. 
Well, that's it, what a leaf is. Uh, right? He says that's that's what a leaf. Yeah, I don't know my. Well, my, leaves I don't and know flowers. my. I don't know my plant. I don't know my plant biology very well, but. Um, but, but digestive yeah. and genital organs, I think of just leaves and flowers and stuff like that on a tree. Yeah, so, yeah, true. Yeah, or whatever. Anyway. And he calls him a footler. I don't even know what that is, but it doesn't sound very nice. You know, before I talk about biology, I should really go and look at a biology textbook and find out what the t- right terms are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. Gosh. Come on, think about, just think about photosynthesis. Just yes. transport yourself back to your sixth, sixth grade classroom. <laughs> photosynthesis. I know, I know. I don't want to talk about plants anymore. All right. But I'm just, I just, I, I just wanted to point that out that that's how Tompkins refers to, you know, right. to plants, right? Plants. You know, they're, 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 they have the absolutely no, no beauty in of itself. Right. And, and there's, you know, the, their beauty comes from them, their utilitarian, mm-hmm. pra- um, their utilitarian properties. But, you know, and this, and this scene ends with um, it saying that Atkins had preserved this one little corner of, of leaf by Nagel of the painting. Um, and it was in a little museum for a little while, but it then was. it was the museum um, was burnt down and the painting was entirely forgotten and Nagel was entirely forgotten. And why is there only a leaf? I know that, because um, what happened to the rest of the painting? Did they? Oh, they used it to patch Parrish's roof, didn't they? Um, let's see. You remember that large one, the one they used to patch the damaged house next door That's, to his yes. after the gales and floods? Yes. I found a corner of it torn off lying in a field. It was damaged but legible. A mountain peak and a spray of leaves. I can't get it out of my mind. Out of your what? <laughs> you pick up on that. Out of your what? You know, said Tompkins. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think he says yeah. that because it's like, what, your mind? Like, you have a mind? Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that that's what happened to the rest of the painting was mm-hmm. it was destroyed because it was used to um, patch Parrish's roof. Right. Which is interesting, you know, to me, that in itself is interesting, too, because, I mean, that would have been the ultimate sacrifice for Nigel, yeah. right? I mean, to patch Parrish's roof with his painting, and that's what ended up happening anyway. Right. Right? Um, without Nigel having a say in it, but... Um, but, you know, I, I view this, and I see, like, again, like, I have this very strong totalitarian, like, these are, like, Nazis, totalitarian. You could say they're, they, they're like communists over in Russia at the time, you know, mm-hmm. who were just like, you know, kill everybody that we need to in order to make sure that the, you know, uh, that the revolution survives and, yep. And, yep. and this kind of mentality so that we can live this efficient communal life. And, um, and Niggle, who's just this little man, is forgotten, yep. you know. Yeah. He's just kind of rolled over, crushed by the wheels of history, right, yeah. and forgotten. And again, you know, I think we, it's at one point in, a, in an old episode we talked about where Tolkien mentions how um, the the great movement, he's convinced that the great movements of the world aren't, aren't actually what we think they are, but that they're the little people and the, and the things that they do. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the big theme of his work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think, I think that's part of what he's trying to say here is that even though Niggle is, you know, Niggle is forgotten in the eyes of these bureaucrats who think that they're the, they're doing the important work, right? Um, and his and his little the works of his hands are forgotten, but we see in that last little glimpse, and from the story itself, that this is the stuff that lasts, right? It's it's the love and the beauty that they created that lasts, and not and not only that it lasts in kind of like this oh it'll go on in our hearts kind of way, but that it becomes the new reality, mm-hmm. you know? It's a creation. It, 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 exactly. It becomes, yeah. it's given its own reality mm-hmm. by grace, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, to me, the story is just suffused with this incredible grace and joy. And, um, I, you know, start talking a little bit about that last little section there. I wanted to find something in one of his letters, actually. Okay. Yeah, so the very last section, they're talking about um, you, the second voice comes back, right, the mm-hmm. second voice from mm-hmm. earlier, and it says um, that it is proving very useful indeed as a holiday, a refreshment, a splendid convalescence. Um, and it says not only for that, but for many it is the best introduction to the mountains. Right. Um, and it says I'm sending more and more there. You know, they seldom have to come back. Right. And um, and then the first voice comes back again and says, "No, that is not so, that. No, that is so. I think we shall have to give the region a name." Right. And he says, "What do you think we should call it?" 
and um, the porter it says, and then the second voice says, oh, didn't you know, the porter, right? The porter settled that long ago. It's called Niggles Parish yeah. in the Bay. And um, and the uh, the guy's like, really? He's like, did you let them know? You know, did you mm-hmm. tell them? And he's like, oh, yeah, I sent them a message. I sent it both of I sent, you know, I sent a message to both of them to tell them. And they, they were like, well, well, what did they say? And it says they both laughed. Laughed. The mountains rang with it. Yeah. So they're talking about this place, right, where Niggle and Parrish meet, and that's where they build their little house, yeah. and that's where they fix up the forest that's kind of gone a little wonky, and that's where they truly get, you know, that's, that's where they, they truly um, yeah. get to really know each other. And um, and it's and in the end, it's remembered as this thing that they both did together. Their names are right. both attached to it. Right, both their names attached you know? to it. Niggle's perish yeah yes. and i mean just what a beautiful last line you know they yes. laughed you know because it's like and it's this laugh of like ironic joy you know mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. it's like you've gotten to the end of the journey and you realize that all of those all of those little annoyances all of the ways in which you failed all of your dreams that didn't come true um weren't all for naught no but they were they, they resulted in something even greater yes, than you could even, possibly yes, imagine yes you know a much much greater um, much much greater. Joy. What I found in his, um, what I wanted to mention in one of his letters, this is again going back to the letter to Peter Hastings, number one fifty three. But it's early on in the letter, and um, uh, Hastings is kind of asking, like, is asking all these in depth questions about, like, you know, the biology of orcs and and just like weird, you know, weird stuff like that in this letter, and um, uh, Tolkien says this. Um, it is only an it is only as yet an incompletely imagined world, a rudimentary secondary. He's, he's talking about Lord of the Rings and, and mm-hmm. Middle Earth. But if it pleased the Creator to give it in a corrected form, reality on any plane, then you would just have to enter it and begin studying its different biology. That is all. Um, and um, and at the end of On Fairy Stories, he again talks about that you know. Again, Tolkien never came right out and said this was his view, but you get this really strong sense that he he never did so because to do so it almost felt like it would cheapen it to say to to try and explain it too clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it seems like his view is really that the things that we make will be given their own reality. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. um, that it's not like we just create and it's and it's like that's the end of the story. Right. You know, like that. If you really think about it, like where is the sense in that? You know, yeah. there's no like why would why would we be called have have this vision given to us to make something and then never and then it never reaches any sort of finality or completion. Mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't it doesn't seem to add up. And so at the end of on fairy stories, um, he said, so great is the bounty with which man has been treated that he may now perhaps fairly dare to guess that in fantasy he may actually assist in the affoliation and multiple enrichment of creation. All tales may come true, and yet at the last redeemed, they may be as like and as unlike the forms that we give them as man, finally redeemed, will be alike and unlike the fallen that we know. Mm. Um, So, you know, at the end of the day, I look at Leaf by Nagel and I think this this is the story where Tolkien kind of bared his soul. You know his creative mm-hmm. soul, mm-hmm. Um, and I know he. You know I know he wouldn't say that it's like totally autobiographical, but I think it's. I think you know you can see from his various letters that it was very close to his heart, mm-hmm. and Absolutely. and it gave expression to something that was a deep longing of his heart. Yeah. Um, he worked on things so meticulously, and it's like I think he spent a lot of time thinking about why he was wired to do that, and and why others were wired to create things. Mm-hmm. And I think in just meditating upon that and in contemplating that, he came to see, he, he just came to this conviction that, it, it, you know, it just doesn't make any sense that, like, it, it's found in his Christian conviction that in the end, um, there's, there's, I have not seen, ear has not heard the, the glory that awaits, right? right? Um, awaits us in heaven. But he kind of goes one step further with it and says, the things that we make with our own hands, the stories we tell, the music we write, you know, it's almost like we'll live in songs, you know, like our, mm. the songs that we write, the places that we, that we paint, 
um, those places are going to come alive. Those songs are going to come alive in ways we can't even possibly imagine. And there, that's where we'll dwell eternally. You know, um, I mean, it's just this, it's an incredible vision. That's just really difficult. It, it feels cheap to even talk about it, you know, like yeah. try to put it into words, yes. but it's still yeah. beautiful and it's still worth expressing. It know? is, it is. And it, it also, it gives those, um, you know, that it, it gives those creative pursuits and their eventual, um, you know, actual tangible results so much more weight, mm-hmm. you know, so much more meaning. Right. Um, and it makes me wonder too, I wonder if Tolkien's dwelling in Middle Earth right now. Yeah. I've thought that at various times, um, you know, and I think he, I think he kind of hoped he would, you know, yeah. and it's kind of, I, I think about it sometimes and I'm like, well, he, he's probably not dwelling in a place full of dragons and orcs and all of that kind of stuff. No. But, 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 but his point, I think his point would be not that it's just like it was in the story, but that it will fully embody everything that he, that was beautiful about those stories that the Rivendell. places. Yeah. Maybe he's dwelling in Rivendell or Rivendell. the Shire. He might be happy in the perspective. Shire. The Shire. <laughs> yeah. Either one of those. Either one of, uh, or either Valinor, one of those. you know, um, yeah. yes. I, I mean, but you know, it, it wouldn't just be that place. It would be that place, but given the full expression, just like Niggle, Right. Painted his picture yes. of the tree, but then he saw it real, and mm-hmm. he was like, "Well, this is far beyond even what I mean. I I envisioned this, but mm-hmm. it's this is the reality. You know, you right. think about seeing a picture of a place and then going there, and how different that is, even though it's the same mm-hmm. place. You right. Know? Yes. Um, yeah. And also, these, you know, I mean, Niggle never finished his tree, right? Yeah. But but um, but he was able to see it. Yeah. Completed, right? So these places, you know, Rivendell, Valinor, Middle Earth, you know, whatever, is gonna. It could be those places, but perfected and glorified, right? You know, which, you know, in my mind, I feel like Rivendell is already perfect. Yeah, <laughs> but it would, you know, just imagine Rivendell glorified. I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, I'm sure it also, um, you know, it sounds to me, especially when we were talking about earlier. That Tolkien, he probably got frustrated with himself. Mm-hmm. You know, you could tell he did have a lot of anxiety about letting things get out of the, out of control, and he was probably frustrated that he couldn't move faster right. and that he couldn't, you know, create more in a shorter amount of time. And so, I feel like that would have been a very comforting, encouraging thought for yes. him to be like, "Well, there's a reason I'm spending all this time. Right? Yeah. It's not wasted. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And in the grand scheme of things." Um, I mean, he he's written one of the highest selling books of all time. I mean, yes. all that all that work, all that work bear, bore a lot of significance in in just here in the here and now, you know. Absolutely, um, yes. But uh, but you know, all of that will end. I mean, a thousand years from now, will anybody remember who Tolkien is? I don't know. Um, but uh, but in eternity, I'm sure he was viewed as you know, even if it didn't hadn't become a big success, if if I you know. He cared more about making the thing, I think, than he did about it being a success. Right, absolutely, you know? yes. Um, which is an encouraging thought for all you know, all us hopeless creative dreamers out there, you know, who want to make things for people mm-hmm. to enjoy. It's like just focus on the making, you yeah. know, just focus on the creating and and steer towards that place that you've been given a vision for mm-hmm. and make that. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Right? It's like. Uh, it may not be in the way that you expect. It may not be in the way that you hope for. But if you if you make that thing that you know you need to make, the good things will happen. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, good things will happen. You know, better things that you can possibly imagine. Just have faith. Mm-hmm. All right. Well. Um, I don't know. Do you think we did leave by Nickel Justice? Gosh, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Such an incredible story. It just feels it like is. I'm sitting here like I, we've had such, we've had a long discussion on it, but, um, you know, I, I, I just love that story. And, um, when you love something that much, you, you just feel like you can't do it the justice it deserves. Right. Um, yeah. I hope that you can help us complete our enjoyment of this story and, um, you know, if there's other things that you love about this story, um, please feel free to chime in, leave comments um, on the uh, on the post. Um, send us 
emails, asking questions about it. We can talk about them on future episodes. Um, I don't intend to just never say anything about Leaf by Nagel again on okay. this podcast. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I feel like, again, it's it's very foundational to my understanding of what Tolkien was doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I, 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 I'm just glad we were able to spend this much time talking about it. Me and, too. No, I enjoyed that. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, I agree, though. I, I feel like, um, yeah, I just don't know that it's possible to do it justice. Yeah. Ever. Um, it, it's just it's just an amazing, an amazing uh, story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, time to say goodbye, I think. Next time we'll be picking back up with uh, The Silmarillion. And uh, I think we've got Chapter 5 coming up, which is of uh, Eldamar and the Princes of Eldalier. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably have no idea what any of that means. But, no clue. Yeah, but you'll, it sounds you'll, cool, though. You'll understand soon, soon enough. Um, you know, coming up, in the, I think in the, over the next 10 episodes, we're going to continue doing some um, uh, some discussion of the Silmarillion. Um, I'd like to get to Mythopoeia soon, which is a poem uh, that's in this same tree and leaf volume. I have a poem that he actually wrote to C.S. Lewis. Um, and it's, it's very much akin to On Fairy Stories and Leaf by Nagel. Um, I'm, I'd also, um, also got some ideas for some future interviews. And, um, and then, uh, I'd like to, um, I'm thinking, I don't want to wait too long. I don't know if I can get all the way through the Silmarillion, um, cause we still got a long way to go. I don't know if I can get all the way through the Silmarillion and not get started on the Lord of the Rings. Um, so I think maybe we're going to, at some point shift into doing maybe one chapter of the Silmarillion one week and then doing the Lord of the Rings chapter the next week. Um, oh, okay. so We'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. There's still a lot of Tolkien left to talk about. Oh, yes. And that's what we do here. That's why this podcast exists, to talk about Tolkien. Um, oh, one other thing we're going to do cool, uh, soon that's cool is we're going to do a little, we're going to do an sh- episode just on wizards. Oh, on, um, sweet. On kind of where, what wizards are all about and where they came from. So nice. definitely tune into that. That'll be coming up here in a few episodes. All right. Um, Thanks, Greta. Thanks for sticking with me for pro- it's probably been an hour and a half now. So this might be our longest episode as a marathon, but... Leaf by Niggle's worth it. That's all I can really yeah. say. Yes. Um, so thanks for those who have listened all the way through. And um, if you, I hope this inspires you to go pick up Leaf by Niggle if you've never read it and read it. And if you've already read it, I hope it inspires you to go read it again. Uh, yes. I just can't get enough of that story. So nope. thanks, everybody. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. On the next episode, we will resume our discussion of the Silmarillion with Chapter 5 of Eldamar and the Princes of the Eldalia. We'd love to know what you think, so please leave us a rating on iTunes or whatever other podcast app you're using. Thanks for listening. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the Colonel of the Middle-Earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril, one of the holy jewels of the Blessed Realm, from the Iron Crown of the Dark Lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers. In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash baron. B-E-R-E-N. Happy reading!